buongiorno e sono molto riconoscente dell'invito di parlare a questa conferenza, ma chiedo scusa se parlo in inglese, ma per essere succinto va meglio così. I'm, ha I'm very happy to talk today about uh, Sir John Soane and his museum because it is one of the rare examples of a house museum from the 18th, 19th century that survives today and because it survives approximately in its uh, original state, it is um, all the more valuable to understand the mentality of uh, the age. <clears throat> I'm showing you here a picture of Sohn at midlife. He was born in 1753 and died in 1837. So his life spanned the periods that we call neoclassicism and romanticism, and many of his attitudes towards art and architecture partake of uh, the period. He was a self-made man and uh, disappointed in his family life, which I think is something that he shared with a number of other people who channeled their uh, emotional vitality into collecting as opposed to uh, their families. Uh, the collection itself became his family. He, um, and here I'm showing you on the right, a view of the center of the museum, the dome area, with an image of the uh, a plaster cast of the Apollo Belvedere, and also surrounded by a number of antique uh, cinerary urns, and also um, reliefs of architectural motifs, some in plaster and some original, mixed together as was the taste in the 18th century. Sohn was a self-made man. Um, he was very proud of the fact that he rose from very humble circumstances to become a powerful figure in um, London of his day. He um, was the son of a bricklayer and initially apprenticed in the uh, building trade, but his talent was spotted and he was Change, he was encouraged by uh, his architectural mentor, George Dance, to study at the Royal Academy. He won two medals, a silver and gold medal for architectural draftsmanship and received a travel grant from King George III. And between 1778 and 1780, he was largely in Italy, but he also went to uh, in addition to the peninsula, he went to Sicily and as far as Malta. And it was there that he made important contacts, not only in the artistic world, but also among other grand travelers, the Milordi Inglesi, who frequented uh, Italy at that time. And these people helped with his career. Um, one of the first people that had an impact on him was Charles-Louis Clérisseau, uh, who was uh, attached to the French Academy, but also was an architect, an architectural theoretician, and also uh, an artist who specialized in uh, painting ruins. And Sohn was fascinated by Clarisseau's work and also by the uh, fragmentation or the ruins, the, the concept of the ruin and the fragment. I'm showing you one of 20 paintings by Clarisseau that he acquired once he had the ability to uh, collect, and it indicates also some of the challenges of those days in trying to understand what one was looking at in Rome, because before Mussolini, it was not all laid out neatly with um, labels uh, and excavations. Uh, there was a great deal of conjecture, and also there was a certain degree of poetry in the ruined forms themselves, which Sohn transfers into his own uh, collections. Equally important, um, he met Piranesi uh, in 1778, just before his death, and Piranesi was impressed by the young man and gave him uh, some uh, engravings of the Pantheon, and Sohn later collected everything that Piranesi published and was very much impressed by his vision of antiquity. Uh, and indeed looking at something like Piranesi's view of the Appian Way, you can uh, see a connection between this piling up, this uh, what Umberto Eco would call a vertiginous 
collecting uh, and the way in which Sohn himself uh, creates this overwhelming feeling of uh, antiquity in his own works. When Sohn came back to London, he uh, almost immediately began to rise in the architectural profession. He um, had several commissions from uh, men whom he had met on the Grand Tour. He married uh, well uh, a young woman who came from a similar background, but whose uncle had great properties in substantial properties in London. And when he died in the 1786, she became an heiress, and Soane didn't really have to work for the rest of his life. But he was very ambitious, and he continued to work while using his wife's fortune and then subsequently the money that he earned uh, to collect. There were two principal models for Soane in uh, the London of the late 18th century. One was the um, great um, collector uh, Charles Townley, who, because he was a Catholic, uh, was denied the possibility of public life, so he focused on collecting. He went to, on the Grand Tour three times. He, was, uh, he used Gavin Hamilton to buy for him, and his uh, purchases were probably one of the most important collections of antiquity in London during that period. And I'm showing you here a famous view of the, um, his townhouse in London, about 1781 to 83. Townley is seated on the right in the chair, and in the center of the room at uh, a desk and turning towards uh, Townley is the uh, mysterious uh, but influential figure of the Baron Dunkerville, who um, was cataloging Townley's collection as he had cataloged the uh, antique vases of Sir William Hamilton earlier. And Dunkerville had a great influence on English collectors and English attitudes towards antiquity at the turn of the 19th century. And he particularly stressed that it was more important to study visually uh, ancient art than to read about it. And Soane certainly uh, took this to heart. But you can see here also some affinity with the way the Soane Museum looks in terms of this piling up of works, this clustering of works right to the very uh, ceiling and the bookcase with the urns on top of them, uh, and also the lantern, uh, the skylight, to give a, a light coming down from above. The other person uh, who was probably even more influential on uh, Soane was Thomas Hope, who was uh, one of the wealthiest men in uh, England at the time and uh, became an arbiter of neoclassical taste, particularly in terms of uh, furniture and the decorative arts. Hope, uh, even more than uh, Townley, uh, built a museum. It wasn't really a house museum, it was a museum with, uh, on the second floor, the, the upper floor, an apartment where he and his family lived, but the public rooms were given over to the display of his great collection, three rooms devoted to antique vases, um, a room, uh, picture gallery, um, also rooms in which he uh, displayed Egyptian art, and also he made prolific use of skylights, lanterns, as you can see in this elevation of the uh, picture gallery, and also mirrors, something that Soane also um, exploited, uh, notably in his displays in his house. As I said, Soane and his wife uh, found themselves with a great uh, patrimony, a great inheritance. And in addition to buying a house in London, which was both his townhouse and architectural practice in 1792, uh, eight years later in 1800, he bought a country estate called Pitshanger, which still exists and is being returned to the state in which Soane left it um, right now in the borough of Ealing to the west of the center of London. It was um, a, um, you can see here a view of it during the time that Soane lived there. The central block was built by Soane. The block on the left was pre-existing, and Soane added this portico uh, inspired by the Arch of Constantine, 
And on the far right, you can see the Roman ruins that he constructed. He created a kind of folly of Roman ruins, which he would then ask his um, pupils to reconstruct the original appearance. In the, uh, it's also important to remember that at Pitzhanger, Soane really began many of the traits that we see now in the London uh, Museum, uh, Sir John Soane's Museum, one of which was the installation which was inspired, as I said, partly by Townley and by Thomas Hope. But you can, one can see affinities with what he later took to uh, his London dwelling when he sold Pitzhanger in 1809. For instance, here, this um, watercolor by one of his uh, amanuenses, uh, John Michael Gandy, shows the library at Pitzhanger, which is distinguished by a starfish vault, a Roman form that uh, he knew from Roman tombs and which he used frequently in his own architecture, um, and also the niches in which uh, cinerary urns are set. Um, and then also here he had a room which was a monk's dining room, a sort of Gothic uh, interior. He had a gallery for calci or plaster casts of architectural forms, all of which reappear in the London house. He also um, began acquiring paintings particularly um, paintings that had interesting provenances, such as uh, the uh, Rake's Progress by William Hogarth, a series of seven paintings which uh, his wife bought, in fact, at auction in 1802. Partly, he was very patriotic. The idea of Hogarth as a great uh, English painter was something that um, resonated with him, but also these works had been bought directly from Hogarth by the actor David Garrick, and Soane was also very influenced by, or stage struck, uh, as one might say. So all of these elements were already in existence at Pitzhanger, but Soane came to the realization around 1808 that his two surviving sons were not going to follow him and become great architects. So this led him to abandoned the country house, which he'd hoped would be an estate for his elder son, and to focus on his London dwelling. I'm showing you um, the museum as it is today, but it's important to bear in mind that it's really three buildings. Uh, the building on the left, Soane bought in 1792. He rebuilt it and faced it in uh, a grayish white brick. And then subsequently in 1808, he bought number 13 and gradually recreated there the nucleus of the museum. And then as his collection expanded in 1822, he bought the building on the right, which was again incorporated, partially incorporated into the museum itself. So if you haven't been there, I'm showing you a couple of images of how this took place. This is a plan of how the house looked around 1810. And what's extraordinary about it is that Soane, as I said, originally built the house. And he took the, the stables of number 12 and turned that into his architectural practice. And then when he bought number 13 in 1808, he incorporated the stables of number 13 into this museum, as he would call it, or academy, uh, while leaving the house intact. And in fact, there was a sitting tenant there. Then on the right, you can see number 14, which didn't enter into the story at this time. But gradually, Soane's original idea was to turn number 13 into a series of gall galleries and live in number 12. But instead of that, he did something more interesting. He persuaded the tenant who is in number 13 to swap houses with him. So the tenant went to live in number 12. He rebuilt number 13 as his residence, and then um, subsequently continued to expand, bought, buying number 14, rebuilding the house, renting the house, but taking the stables area and turning it into part of the museum. So what you see today is the museum 
in uh, the, the plan of the museum, number 13 is in the shape of a T, and the other two buildings are ancillary. In fact, when Soane died in 1837, he left the front house, the, the house in number 14, to his grandchildren, but um, the trustees of the museum bought it back in the 1990s, so we've been able to incorporate a lot of the offices, uh, the research work of the museum into this area so that we could turn the museum back over a period of 20 years, more or less into the, to the uh, appearance that it had in Soane's day. I'm showing you here two images of the museum. Soane had a distinction in his mind between the house, which was the front part where he lived, and the museum, which was both his architectural studio and also his museum, his collection, his reference library, if you will. And the image on the left shows you, even before he began building uh, number 13, when he acquired the property and was going to take over the stables, he had an idea which remained constant. That is that the basement area was going to be a kind of crypt which would um, include his collection of cinerary urns and be essentially associated with the idea of death. It would be lit from above to create a kind of penumbra. And above it was his collection of plaster casts. But already by 1813, when this view was taken by John Michael Gandhi, um, he had expanded, opened up the area so that everything, the light came flooding down from the dome and created uh, a Piranesian effect. In fact, Gandhi heightens the uh, effect by giving a very low perspective from which we're looking up towards the dome at the top of the sheet. And also, this is an image of it taken at night. Soane was very fond of having people visit it by candlelight or with illuminations, uh, something which was, again, a kind of 18th century grand tour uh, activity when people would go and explore the catacombs of Rome by torchlight. As I said, Soane had a distinction initially between the house and the museum, and he tried to keep this distinction, but gradually as his collections grew, he never really resolved the issue. I'm showing you now uh, one of the two front rooms on the ground floor, which is pretty much as it was in Soane's day, and it's, a, it's an example of uh, a well-to-do Regency period uh, interior. Notice in particular the Greek vases <clears throat> on, the, uh, on top of the bookshelves. Um, there are the reliefs uh, tucked in. The color of the walls is a kind of Pompeian red. And also you can perhaps just, well, you can't really uh, over here, but in this arch you can, there is a mirror which helps to reflect light on the, um, in fact, both, that, both of those arches reflect light onto the vases that are in front of them. Soane bought in bulk. He, uh, we have about 60 uh, vases, and um, 40 of them he bought at one uh, auction. In fact, he didn't buy anything in Italy. When he was in Italy as a student, he was too poor to collect. But when he came back, he took advantage of his wife's fortune and his own money that he was earning and bought regularly through uh, the auction houses, particularly Christie's. He had a very close relationship with James Christie and James Christie uh, the Younger. He also bought uh, enormous numbers of books. We have 7,500 books. And like many collectors, he was... <laughs> Like many collectors, he was very much taken with, uh, was a target for people who wanted to sell things. The um, plaster cast came from other architectural collections. I'm showing you the installation as it appeared in 1825. He stressed the fact that these had to be life-size because they were important for the, um, his students to be able to study them because for much of his career, the Napoleonic Wars meant that you couldn't go uh, abroad. I mentioned the fact that he liked trophies, the, and he would change them around. The 
collection was constantly in a state of flux. This great crater vase he uh, paid 68 pounds for, which was quite a lot of money in those days. And in the, on the right, you see it uh, in the crypt before the arrival of the um, sarcophagus of the Emperor Seti IV, Seti I, which now holds sway. Um, one of the later additions was a picture room, which is a room about four by four by six meters, in which through the use of these panels, Sohn was able to have 118 paintings, so that it was almost, uh, it, it encompassed a number of works of art which were three times as large. And it's interesting that he built this in 1824 because at that moment the National Gallery opened in London as a house museum. It only moved into Trafalgar Square in 1837, the year Sohn died. So people complained about the fact that it was really just a house museum, but Sohn came out of the same tradition as did the British Museum originally, and it happened that at the time when Sohn was dying, both of these other institutions were turning into uh, the kind of monumental neoclassical museums that we know today. Finally, I just want to say that this Sohn's display, he said, was uh, studies for my own mind. It's heterogeneous. It doesn't correspond to chronology or archaeology. If we look at a display like this, it is really, uh, you can see the influence of Dunkerville uh, in the tracing of motifs such as the garlands across different antiquity uh, and also through the Renaissance. Uh, there's Donatello there, there's also uh, Michelangelo. So it's really something that resembles, uh, in many ways, uh, Abbe Warburg's Builder Atlas. Or indeed, if one wanted a contemporary uh, example, it would be something like the Barnes Museum, yeah, Barnes Collection in Philadelphia, which is very focused, formalistic approach in which we, one is looking at examples of motifs that go from decorative arts into painting and back again. And finally, I just want to conclude by saying that Sohn uh, was, we think of the Sohn collection as antiquities, but also he was very heavily invested in modern British. He uh, a room like the Tivoli Recess here is essentially a gal was a, a gallery of contemporary British sculpture. Thomas Banks, Flaxman, Chantry, and the like. And Soane wanted his collection to inspire later generations of architects, but also artists and designers. And so we feel it is part of our mission to show works of art by contemporary artists. Uh, on the right, I'm showing you uh, one of 12 sculptures that the sculptor Mark Quinn made in response to the collection and were displayed with us in 2017. And here, one, one of his sculptures is juxtaposed between two 18th century casts of the Medici Venus. By the same token, uh, we also had a young architect, Adam Nathaniel Furman, who created these tempietti on, uh, in, uh, on a computer, and then they were printed on a 3D printer glazed and displayed on a, sculpt, uh, on a table that he also uh, built in our um, recently renovated uh, kitchens. So my last image is going back to the beginning to Sohn himself. Um, his museum was autobiographical. At his death in 1837, he asked for the, his bust to be put on this monopodium in the center of the dome, looking at the Apollo Belvedere, flanked by two statuettes of Michelangelo and Raphael, as if to suggest that he was the end of a great tradition or its apex, um, beginning to look or looking towards the next page in the history of art and architecture. So I just would like to leave you with a quotation from the French anthropologist Marcel Mauss, uh, which I think underscores the motivation of Sohn or the enig enigma that we is a challenge of collections like Sohn and perhaps many of the others that we're hearing about today. And this is what Mauss says. There is a moment when the science of certain facts not being reduced into concepts, the facts not even being organically grouped together, 
these masses of facts receive that signpost of ignorance, miscellaneous. This is where we have to dig. Thank you.